Perfect. Now I have your number. Thanks. Hey, I'm Robbie Kramer. You're listening to the Leverage Podcast, where we discuss using your social skills to hack dating, travel, finding your dream job, and becoming a complete man. So I'm sure many of you guys have heard me ramble on on this podcast before about the importance of your image, and it still totally baffles and boggles my mind how many guys don't understand that literally the easiest thing that would have the biggest impact on their dating and love lives was simply tweaking your image. And it's something that you can do virtually overnight. It doesn't require changing your personality, building confidence, getting going out and being rejected or experiencing a lot of the downsides when it comes to dating. And even guys who have worked on this still don't get it right. And even as using myself as, as an example, almost you know, every month I find something new I can do to improve my image, whether that's grooming or you know, a different sort of hairstyle or just keeping up with the latest trends in fashion. Uh, so I have someone today who's obviously not just an expert when it comes to helping people look their best but an expert all around in dating relationships, Kimmy Seltzer. She's a confidence therapist, an authentic dating strategist with a vat of knowledge and experience as a therapist, a certified style coach, dating coach, and matchmaker. She's helped people find lasting love and connection, attract success, and build valuable relationships using her unique confidence makeover process. And using an outside-in approach, Kimmy implements targeted style, emotional, and social intelligence in people's lives using her signature, the Charisma Quotient, which I'm excited to hear more about, working on body language, first impressions, image, and messaging, and how it imp impacts attraction. Uh, she's based in Los Angeles and travels the country, helping people discover their confidence and charisma. And Kimmy is also a regular contributor to the Huffington Post, with appearances in too many nationally uh, recognized publications to even name. Uh, she's been the leading love expert on the traveling live dating show, The Great Love Debate, and the cable reality dating show, The Romance. And you can also listen to her on her podcast, which I was recently a guest on, which is a lot of fun. And that's called The Charisma, Cro the Charisma Quotient. Excuse me. So, Kimmy, welcome. Thanks for coming. Oh, my gosh. Thanks for having me. So, as, uh, as we discussed before, um, you know, when it comes to dating, confidence, love life, um, you know, you've been in this field forever. Uh, we have a mutual friend, uh, Jordan, who's been a guest on this podcast before. Um, yes, I feel like he should be here. So <laughs> he really should. <laughs> Join the conversation. I know. Hi, Jordan. Yeah, Jordan Harbinger, for, for those of you guys who, who have heard him, he's a very well-known podcaster. Um, so when, you know, when we were introduced, I was really excited to, you know, to find out we had him in common. Um, and you've been in this industry forever, as have I. So tell us your story. How did you get involved in this? And you have such an amazing background um, with just your field of study and expertise. Yeah, I actually am. I'm, I'm always like chuckling when people read my bio because I, it's it's almost like, how did I get here? <laughs> you know, because <laughs> it's like I'm just an old lady. I've been around the block forever. And the truth is, is that the real reason why I'm so passionate about doing what I do. And, and besides all the stuff you read, I'm, uh, it, it really has to do with my own transformation. And I know you shared your story on my podcast and like you, I kind of had some adversity and things happened to me along the way that kind of shot my confidence and really thrust me into what I'm doing right now. And I mean, the, the quick version of the long story is that I was this kind of um, good girl from Chicago living a very traditional life. I practiced as a therapist for many, many years. And um, I had this kind of you know, traditional house with the picket fence and a couple of kids and the husband and the dog and, you know, like life was grand. And I thought that was going to be my life. And mm -hmm. so then we all pick up and we move across the country to hear La La Land. And as, as the typical La La Land story goes, I, we get here and we do what everyone else does. We get a divorce. So 
joking, obviously. <laughs> no, it's you know, true. It's, uh... <laughs> it's sad, sad, sad like, but true. Yeah. Divorce happens everywhere. I like to excuse LA, but the truth was, is there was other issues going on in this fairy tale. Right. And, mm -hmm. but you know, it was a really, really defining moment in my life because I remember, you know, just, it was like the record stopped and this, you know, life as I knew it just poof went away in an instant. And I honestly didn't know what I was going to do in my new life. And, you know, if you would have known me back then, if people had come to me for advice as a therapist, I would have said, you think your life is bad. Like I'm going to go on the couch for a second. <laughs> like I was in no way, shape or form to help anybody else, let alone myself. And I have to say like, you know, when you go towards this like path in your life and there's a fork in the road and you have a choice. Like you could go down one path or the other. I was going down a very dark path and my clothes definitely reflected that. I called my, that period, my dark black period. And in my wardrobe, all, all that it was, was just ginormous black clothes that just would keep me hidden from the world. Quite honestly, I didn't know that at the time, but I, here's the, and it was the kicker is like, here I am a therapist. I should know better. I should know how to get out of my own way. Yet I couldn't, I was stuck right there in that dark path. And I had done therapy. I had done CBT, you know, like, as you call it, the cognitive behavioral therapy. I, I had a great support system. My friends rallied around me. I couldn't move. I, I was just standing still. And I remember getting up one day and looking in the mirror and I was horrified at what I saw. I was like, what have I become? I was this, I just saw this frumpy mom. I still had my nursing bras on. Now, mind you, I was not nursing any longer. <laughs> just like, it was, it was just like, that was me. I had my Birkenstocks on. It, it was just, I was a mess. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, I got to do something different. And so I, I go shopping. What does a girl do when she's not feeling great in her clothes? She goes shopping. So I shopping therapy, I go and what am I doing again? I'm collecting black clothes in. Mm. I, I just remember holding all these like black clothes and they were all three sizes too big still. And this personal train, or personal train, personal shopper, she comes up to me and she says, ma'am, I've been watching you and I really <laughs> think you should try this on. And she uh -huh. holds up this red dress and I call it my red dress moment. I looked at it and I said, that's really sweet of you, but that's not my size. And that's really not my color. She said, honey, that is your size. That is your color. Try it on. Hmm. And it was like, Again, she hit me over the head with that red dress. And I said, yeah, you know, I, I, I got to do something different. I got to move. I got to move. I got to wear something that makes me feel different and good. And so I slipped it on like Cinderella. I twirled around and I look <laughs> in the mirror. I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm I'm a princess. Like, I, I haven't seen myself in so long that I forgot who I was. Wow. And it just to interrupt you for a second, did no, go. were you, you know, did anything change as far as like, you know, how you looked or it was just all the, the feeling of, and the, the pain of going through that divorce that was kind of how you're feeling on the inside, expressing itself on the outside, or was it a combination? You know, it was, it was a combination of things. And in that moment, when I saw, like, I, I bought the dress that day, just to almost as a costume, I called it mm -hmm. because I thought, all right, well, I'm going to marinate in this and I'll see like how it feels. I'll try it on for size. And one of it is that I didn't see my body. I, I, I have forgotten just like really who I was and I had lost all this weight. I call it the divorce diet. I do not recommend that at <laughs> home. Um, but I did start getting a healthier lifestyle and I started exercising more. And that dress, when it was fitting me, I, I like, I saw my body for the first time. And so there was this visceral response mm -hmm. in answer to your question that started happening to me. And when I walked out into the world, it's like all these people started noticing me. Now, I'm sure I got noticed before, but I was scared. I, in my black clothes, I determined in that moment, was my cloak. 
to keep me invisible right. from you alien men. And I really thought you guys were aliens. Like I did not know what to do. I didn't know how to look at you. I didn't know how to <laughs> flirt. And I was scared. I was really, really scared. I mean, here I was married for so long, mom with young kids who could love me, who could find me sexy, you know, like, mm -hmm. so as I was starting to wear that red dress, I started embodying that. And it's exactly what you just said. There was this symbiotic relationship between the outer and the inner when it comes to confidence. And it, not only changed me, but the course of which I like did my business and helped other people with their transformation. And I think you even said it before is that there's not too many things in life where you can have that instant result, that instant gratification and see yeah. yourself differently. All that inner work takes time and effort and repetition. And so working, I realize working on your image and your style and your first impressions and your body language is the quickest gateway into getting some more inner game and confidence. And it works hand in hand. So now, be, you know, as a therapist, I used to work from the inside out. Now I work from the outside in. So I start with people's style and first impressions, and then I go inward. Yeah. I mean, it's such a game changer because when you feel like you look good, and you like what you see in the mirror, there's nothing that does more for your confidence than that. And, you know, I've tried everything, all sorts of quick fixes and magic pills when it comes to like building confidence. And it wasn't until I did what I knew I needed to do that whole time, which was lose weight and, you know, look what I look in, have the experience where I liked what I saw in the mirror that finally really allowed me to have like a major breakthrough later in my, uh, in my dating journey. But I want to ask you, so before, prior to your marriage was, did you have a, a, like, you know, an avid dating experience or what was it like getting back out there after the divorce? Cause I, I can imagine being in LA, which is such a brutal, you know, dating market at, at times. Like, what was that like? Well, you know, and I tell this story all the time is like before that happened, and I don't know how many of you listening have experienced this, but I, I consider myself a pretty confident person. You know, I, I thought, like, I enjoy people. I, I was happy with my career. I got married young, so I didn't have a ton of dating experiences, but I, you know, I felt good. I didn't, I didn't consider that something as being a part of my identity or confidence. Right. But when the divorce hit, I was like, who am I? Like, this isn't me. I just, I remember saying that over and over. This isn't me. Mm -hmm. You know, like what happened to me? And I think this just shows you how there's so many different kinds of confidence. And I know you teach this as well when it comes to like dating, relating, you know, anything like you could be really confident maybe inside, but then your outside's not, or right. maybe you're confident socially, but then you look in the mirror and you're like, Ugh, I just don't like what I see or I'm aging or I'm gaining weight or whatever it is. So yeah, like it took that, the red dress moment, but then beyond the red dress moment, I had to start getting more clothes and starting seeing myself a certain way because at the end of the day, and I tell both men and women, this it's like, when you find yourself sexy, when you look in the mirror and you love you, that's when other people will too. End of story. Right. It's not even about the other person, really. It's about you. Right. Yeah. And we, we spoke about this before, and it was so fascinating to kind of get the take from the opposite gender on, you know, things that that women struggle with and deal with as far as confidence and dating, because as guys, of course, we're so worried about ourselves and we're so worried like, oh, I'm going to say the wrong thing or I don't know what to say or, you know, I'm going to screw this up. Um, so I, I'm curious in, you know, getting back out there in the dating process, what were the things for you that you needed to, you know, what were some of those demons that you had to deal with? And a lot of the stuff I'm sure you deal with all the time with your clients, right? Oh my gosh, a hundred percent. And then I have a story to share with you around that. But like, you know, for me, I remember as I was going through the process, it's exactly what I teach. And that is the charisma quotient. And there's kind of three ingredients or three pillars, if you will. You know, mm -hmm. the first one was mastering just 
you know, my first impressions. Cause I know that I was hiding in so many ways, not just in my clothes, but my body language as well. So just getting used to making on eye contact with you aliens, like, and, uh -huh. and being okay with it and not like looking away and, you know, learning how to move my body so that it was more open and, and having that energy again to like really put myself in situations so that I could feel confident just in my body, you know? So that was raising my style intelligence. I call it. That's the first ingredient. Then the second was really working on my emotional intelligence, meaning how I could express myself, how to be more vulnerable, how to set boundaries, how to let men earn me. Because, you know, back then I didn't, I didn't feel lovable and I didn't feel like I could date as a single mom. Like I thought that was so weird almost, mm -hmm. you know, with small children. So yeah, I had to kind of learn how to express myself, but in a different way, in a flirty way, in a dateable way, you know, and that's the other thing that I think a lot of times people struggle with, at least the people that I work with, they don't know what vulnerability necessarily means. They think it's maybe sure. TMI, right? Like, right. I don't know if you heard, it's like, oh, I don't want to just barf up my whole like life story. It's a huge misconception. It's and it comes not what yeah. it is <laughs> the whole podcast on this as well but that was that was my journey and here i am a therapist right oh my god i was the worst i used to date like a therapist can you imagine like i the guys were i was like scaring the men you know like the like the normal dudes would be like uh okay i'm suddenly feeling like i'm on the couch <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, and so it was so not sexy but then like the ones who were like fixer uppers who needed help loved me, you know, so then sure. here I was, I kept attracting that. So God, I had to get rid of that pattern. The third pillar is your social intelligence. And I know you work with us a lot too. And that is how your interpersonal skills, your, you know, just how you manage flirting, for instance, um, right. how you interact with the opposite sex and all that. And, and, and definitely the conversation skills. I work with people a lot on that. So that was my journey. And now that I've translated that into like helping, you know, other people with that. And to me, I just feel like it's helping people with strategies. You know, I I'm calling myself now a dating strategist more than a coach. Cause I just feel like we're all pretty savvy yeah, and we know our issues. It's just the now what? Like, what do we do about it to break those patterns and get the strategies in place? And yeah, the style piece, to your point, is such an easy way to start with that. And you men, yeah, like you're notorious to not thinking or seeing that style's as important as the inner game. And the outer right. game is just as important. Let me tell you, we women, we notice, we like mm -hmm. your shoes. We like shiny teeth. We like <laughs> when clothes, you know, fit you well and that you're well-dressed. Mm -hmm. I heard uh, you can confirm or deny this. I heard that when women check you out, they first look at your eyes then they look at your shoes and they kind of scan you from bottom <laughs> to top. <laughs> I'll have to think about that. Oh my God. That's funny. Yeah. Cause I tell guys like got your shoe game needs to be on point because they're going to look at your face and look at your shoes. And we if love your shoes. shoes. Are horrible, yeah. It's so cute. Like a guy could wear, I tell guys all the time, you could wear a t-shirt and jeans and then have just like these funky shoes. And it just tells a story about you. Like it gives mm -hmm. you some confidence and style to you. And, and, totally. and the, thing that about guys that's really great in ways of dressing is that a lot of the styles are everlasting. Like you can get some really good key pieces that will last you a long time. And of course, like over the years, you're going to tweak things here and there. But if you haven't been shopping in a while and your wardrobe is filled with like acid wash jeans and pleated pants, like you need to contact me. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> For sure. Like that is not happening. <laughs> Well, I'm curious, what, is, what are some of the, like the two biggest style mistakes you see with guys and also with women that you work on first? Yeah. Well, with men is definitely, they tend to wear things too big, too baggy, uh, yeah. especially the jeans. Like that's yeah. something a lot of guys are into comfort and I realize and recognize that. And so I'm always like teaching men about like the current, like the current jeans today are so comfortable and they have a lot of stretchy oh, cotton yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And so guys are really amazed when they step into more like a designer jean on how well they can feel. So the mistake is, is that guys will buy 
the jeans or pants too big because they don't like things like too tight on them. Or I'll hear a lot of guys say, well, I don't want to be too Metro or too LA or, you know, whatever it is that's going on their misconception about it. But the truth is, is when you get a good fitted jean that really fits your body type, you can look well dressed, you look long, you look lean. It's just, it's really does well with your physique. Mm -hmm. So that's a big mistake. And then another one is just uh, honestly, just not caring. Mm -hmm. I I think that's a big mistake. (laughs) I I, I, like, I hate to be so general, but I, I think that like men get really turned on and into when a woman is dressed well, but then they forget that we get turned on too when a guy is dressed well. And it, Honestly, it doesn't take much, really. Like, oh yeah, I got a, women. I got a haircut once and a, and a shave, you know, and they did like really nice lines. And I can't tell you how many compliments I got. I started doing it every two weeks. Yeah, because it's just like girls are like, wow, you look beautiful. I'm like, beautiful me. What? <laughs> See, it does not. Okay. Here's the difference that I see between men and women, because like women really get down on men saying, oh, they're so visual. And that's all they think about. I like, look, ladies, you are visual too. Like, Mm -hmm. but here's the difference. I feel like, you know, women were a little more forgiving. Like we, as long as a guy is well-dressed and he looks, you know, kind of like, things matter. Like he cares. Mm -hmm. We'll we'll like that, you know, and we'll, we'll forgive the other stuff. Right. A guy will look at a woman and he first like looks at whether or not he is attracted and wants to have sex with her. Like, it's just like that, like fast knee jerk reaction. Mm -hmm. And so guys look at sex and women look at success. Mm-hmm. I feel like in that first, like really like millisecond, it only takes seven seconds now to make a first impression, which is crazy to me because wow. it used to be 30 seconds a couple of years ago. Now it's seven. Really? Seconds. Yeah. Wow. That's an interesting study. That's, uh, I know. I know. Yeah. And I, I almost think that it's faster now with Tinder and Bumble and all oh, that. For sure. because, I mean, we're going so time. fast. Yeah. And, yeah. and in the brain, what, what they studied, and this is just research, not me talking, mm-hmm. is that people make judgments and assumptions based on two things and two things only. One is the clothes that you wear. And the second is the attitude that you have. Yeah. So what you say isn't even as important as how you show up. That's why I think that outer game is so important to really like get a handle on that. And again, like I said, it does not take much if you're a guy. So groom yourself, act like you matter, yeah. <laughs> you know, dress like you care. And for God's sakes, no big jeans. For God's sakes, no big jeans. Amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Every, every time I look through a guy's closet, they've got you know, 35 button down, really expensive, horrible shirts and one big pair of baggy jeans. I'm like, you know, they all spend their money on, on like dress shirts. Every guy that yeah. that's like the biggest mistake I always see. Yeah. Oh, and I thought of another <laughs> thing. And this is, this is more the impact and effect on like who you're attracting. So a big, and I'm sure you get this too. A big thing that a lot of guys complain about is they say, oh, you know, I never attract the kind of woman that I'm attracted to. Mm -hmm. Right. Don't you hear hear that that all the time? Yeah. Right. Like that's like the most common thing. And, and one of the things that I see is that they'll get attracted to a woman with like a certain look or caliber, but then they look like crap, you know? And so it's like, like attracts like, and they don't think about that. Like I do these um, sessions called virtual makeover sessions where I hop on, you know, zoom for an hour and I have this software. It's really cool. And I teach people about their body type and I pick out clothes for them and, this guy I did one with, it was so funny. He's like, well, I want a really athletic woman who's well-dressed and, you know, just, you know, she, she cares about the way she looks. And I said, great. Like, I'm, I'm happy to help you. Let's do a virtual session. So we hop on zoom and I got to tell you, like, he looked like crap. He had, (laughs) he had this, (laughs) seriously, he had this big, like, baseball jersey on I don't even know what it was and yeah. then when he stood up he showed me he did have the acid wash jeans on he was kind of nice. like not groomed and I had to have like a heart to heart to for, with him I said look you know I, I can help you attract maybe a little bit more of what you're looking for but you're asking for something that you're not right Do you know what I mean by that <laughs> he's like oh 
Like he didn't even think about it. And so feedback, yeah. you felt the feedback setting in like, oh, fuck, yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we, we got him some nice looks and nice button down shirt and some jeans that fit him. And I told him to groom himself and, and his pictures vastly improved, you know, online after that. And he said he started getting much better quality women. Yeah. Oh, I can imagine. Uh, I was also curious. So you, you started obviously as a therapist and when, when you were first going, you know, with your career, were you always like focused on dating or is that something that came out of the divorce and it transitioned into helping that specific niche? You know, that is such a good question. And I don't get asked that a lot. I love this question because it was, there were a lot of twists and turns that happened like during my path. And when I first decided um, to do this like image stuff, I, I, there was this woman, she was one of the top image consultants here in LA. I decided to hire her so that I could shadow her and also like just learn the art of image consulting. And then I did a correspondence course over in the UK called style coaching, which kind of mirrored the style and the therapy piece. And I became obsessed with this whole like notion of image because of course I had my own transformation. And then I would watch those shows, like what not to wear. I don't know if you mm-hmm. remember those shows. I was obsessed. I was like, Oh my gosh, see those people look happy. Like I wonder what <laughs> happens to those people afterwards, you know? And And so I just started looking at all of the components of what makes people feel good, confident. And I wasn't thinking about the dating thing. I actually thought I was just going to do makeovers with, you know, many people. And I still do. I mean, I work with people who are not single as well. But I I got asked or introduced to another dating coach. I don't know if you know him, David Wygant. Yeah. And he was... Uh Yeah, he he like is a veteran. Like he's yeah. been doing this for a long time. I and think they based Hitch the movie off of him. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. And what was so funny is people were connecting me with him thinking, yeah, like that would be interesting. You two should pair up and see what would happen and I finally got a meeting with him. You this is a funny story. He had me meet him at this cafe and I show up. I thought I was just meeting with him. No, I'm meeting with him and 25 guys at his boot camp. No way. He's like, <laughs> he's like you must be Seltzer. I'm like, uh, yeah, you must be Y again. He looks at me up and down. He goes, okay, you'll do. Who's going in Seltzer's car? <laughs> and that was it. Really? And at, at that moment, I started like understanding and learning more about this, like infield dating coaching stuff. Mm-hmm. But also I was so... I, I, I just loved, it was like heartfelt to see so many guys come together and really talk about like serious things. It wasn't just about pickup. It wasn't right. just about, here's a bunch of lines. Like these guys had a lot of social confidence issues and things that they dealt with growing up. And as a therapist, I, I ended up talking with them and really helping them kind of break through some of those, you know, barriers that were there for them. And that's where it kind of started with the whole single thing. And then I started speaking and I don't know, like you heard the rest of my bio. So, but that, that's, that's how I got into it. Yeah. I was always fascinated because I've, I've often considered going back to school and, you know, pursuing a, a therapy degree or, you know, it's, it's always been a fascinating subject and it's so obviously closely correlated with, with dating strategy and coaching. Um, so I love to always ask therapists about that. And, um, you know, cause you, it, you just have so much knowledge on how the brain works and how people kind of operate and how those decisions go into it. Um, I'm curious, did you, when it comes to sort of the issues you see around men, how correlated are those to women? And, uh, you know, cause as guys, of course, we're, you know, we tend to think we might know, but I, I, we have no idea. <laughs> I know. Well, I honestly, <clears throat> I know we talked about this in my podcast, but mm-hmm. it's all the same. I, yeah. we, we each think we're all so different, but at the end of the day, we all want the same thing. And that is to feel accepted, to feel like we belong and to be loved really. Right obviously we have gender differences and the way things that get manifested are different and the maybe like cultural and gender roles that are expected of us. Right. Like, so that obviously plays into it, 
But, you know, like for instance, when you're, you know, in that initiation phase with, a, with the approach, I, it, men are fascinated when they hear that I coach women in the approach phase. Cause oh, men yeah. think, oh yeah. Cause mm-hmm. men think, oh, well, what do you all have to do? Like, you know, just be like, receptive you, I, at least at the very yeah. minimum, right? Yeah. Yeah. So and, yeah, tell me more about that. Cause obviously there's a ton of stuff women can do to be more approachable. Um, heck yeah. Yeah. Like what is that? Give us. Oh the dirt yeah. <laughs> I mean, I could go on and on about this. Cause I, you know, here's my theory is that I feel like both genders like are responsible for approachability. You know, I don't think it's just the man. I don't think it's just the women. I think we both have that responsibility in connecting with one another. And, you know, for women that I think the biggest mistake that they make is that first of all, they have the RBF on the resting bitch face, and they don't even realize that it's written on their face and they are making it harder for guys to approach. And then women are getting mad at the men that there's no more alpha men anymore and, al- and the guys aren't approaching. So we're at a stalemate. Right. So what do we do, you know, as both sexes? I and mean, the answer is, is that we both have got to make it a little easier for one another and really open up and show that like that that cab light is on. So that's what I'm teaching women all the time. And I do these flirt challenges for women. And it's amazing how many women enter this challenge. Like this is a hard thing for women. And I think there's a lot of fear that has ended up happening with the Me Too movement and all the things that are going on. So women are in fear and they're clamming up and <clears throat> And in the same notion, so are men because they don't want to, you know, step overstep their bounds. So I teach women a lot about flirting. And obviously, it's like a lot of what we're talking about, you know, first of all, like showing up and dressing up and dressing the part, Mm -hmm. you know, like how I dressed back in the days is not something you should do. Just so you know, like women, if you're, I don't know if you have any women listeners, but this is something that is such an easy hack. If women can really pay attention to what they put on their bodies and, you know, wear a dress, wear something red, wear something sparkly, like men like those feminine things. Mm -hmm. And, and a lot of women don't like think about that either. Believe it or not. A lot of women do not think about that. You think all women like shopping, but they don't. (laughs) I mean, the, 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 the difference that I've seen, um, you know, in like Eastern Europe versus in the U S and how much more effort the women over there put in, like, you know, they're completely, and I think this is, you know, too much. I think there's a happy medium, but you know, they're in full makeup, you know, looks like they've spent hours on their hair to like, you know, just walking to the grocery store, to the, to the gym versus then I come back to the U S and I see most people wearing like, you know, like big bags on their. <laughs> oh my gosh, totally. And so here's just, the thing. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, I love, like, I, I'd be happy every day if women just wore like yoga pants. That's, that's fine. Yes, with me. I, I was just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to put a disclaimer on, you know, that whole like casual stuff is that casual can still be super sexy. And oh. I do. Th- you know, but it's a matter of putting yourself together well when you have that casual clothes on. Same, same with guys. Right. So, like wearing like, sloppy- like, yeah, wear workout shoes. I'm like, those aren't workout clothes. Those like, are just right. socks that you pulled out of a dumpster. <laughs> like those are that's not workout clothes. <laughs> so. Completely, completely. And like to your point, yoga pants is super sexy. Like every guy tells me they love yoga pants on yeah. a girl, but you also love dresses and you also love heels and you mm-hmm. also like sparkly things. Like we, we all like versatility. And as women, we love a guy in a t-shirt and jeans who can like look rugged and hot, but we also love a guy in a, a tux and a suit. That's, that's, you know, super sexy to us yeah. when we see that versatility. So again, We are all not that different. Obviously, we wear different things, but but the notion is the same. And, you know, the other thing I teach women to be more approachable is the body language. That is huge. You know, just, you know, receiving that eye contact from the guy. You know, we were talking on my podcast about the Latin culture. Like, the women are super sexy with that, too. Like, they can hold a gaze like no one else. And, they're super confident in that, you know, and a lot of people here, at least in America or just even all over the world, like that's scary and smiling. Yeah. I know we have our masks on right now, 
but you can still smile with your eyes. You can still yeah. move and say hello and be open with your body stance. And so again, like women also can be more open energetically. And the final thing is like positioning, like no one is going to talk to you ladies. If you're sitting in the corner of a restaurant, cackling with your girlfriends, and talking about how much men suck. Like that's the worst, you know, like the, the Debbie Downer syndrome, you know? And so place yourself, you know, where the men are so that you're right there and make it easier for them to say hello to you. Yeah. I tell guys all the time, like you go to the, the end of the bar close to the bathroom because that's when you're going to get the most traffic. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. So if you're a girl, stand by the end of the bar by the bathroom and you'll... <laughs> Oh my gosh. I, I, I feel like, I feel like we need to do a retreat somewhere. We some, should. Yeah. Seriously. I'm feeling that we should do it like in different parts of the country. That'd be really <laughs> cool. Yeah. Uh, so when you're another question about the women that you work with, how often are you running into, I don't want to call it maybe the complaints or just like the the frustration of meeting too many guys who might be players or uh, guys yeah. who are looking for maybe a more casual sort of thing. Um, Cause that's a huge thing on my side with the guys I work with are a lot of them. Um, you know, they, they don't know when they come to me, they don't know how to authentically say like, I'm, I just want to date casually or I'm not looking, I'm just out of a relationship. And I want to have fun. I want to have sex, but I don't want to commit to anything. And they always have this fear that like every woman wants a relationship. I'm like, guys, there's so many out there, as many as you that maybe just want to have fun and keep things casual. But your mindset is that, you know, that's what everyone wants. So I'm curious if that goes the other way with the women that you meet or the guys that you work with. Oh, yeah. I think there's, again, a lot of like societal expectations and pressure on what's like right, you know, right. and as a woman, I think it can be even harder to say that you just want something casual. And, and, and actually, that's one of the things that I always do with women is I have them create a mission statement. I do this with men too. And like, like a, biz, a business mission statement, mm -hmm. what are you set out to do? You know, like, what is it that you want right now? And I can't tell you eight times out of 10, most people don't even know what they want. Oh yeah, And that's the worst. So like, it's, it's going to be really hard to approach a woman or a man for that matter, if you're really not clear on what it is you want. Because I think for women, there's a lot of shame around just saying, Hey, I want something casual. Like, I just want to have sex. I just got out of this long ass divorce. I don't want a relationship. I just want to have fun, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I think it, it depends on the parties. It depends on the people and what your mission is and being really clear with telling that person what it is. But in terms of the player thing, like, I'm glad you mentioned that. I think for women, like we really feel when you're playing, like we really feel when it's a line and it's not authentic. And I, I think that the more you can just like say who you are and, and authentically just be you, that's what we like. That's what we want. And from there, anything can happen. Like, I mean, then it's up to the two people, whether or not it's casual or that kind of thing. But in, upon entry, I think it's just being just connecting. I tell people all the time, just if you can just focus on two C words, connecting and being curious. Don't yeah. go beyond that. Like, just see if there's a connection. Then you can worry about, you know, the rest, but just be really clear and, and present when you're connecting with that person. Yeah. And the curiosity is so key too. Huge. If you're just genuinely curious, I mean, that right. for conversation skills, that, that will take care of a lot of it. Um, one thing I see that I'm constantly coaching guys on, and I wanted to get your perspective from the woman's side is... The biggest mistake I see is just guys are over-investing, chasing, um, and pushing women away who are initially kind of interested in them. And it just comes from this neediness or a place of, um, you know, a lack of abundance. Um, and do you, do you hear women complaining about that? Or like, oh, I thought he was cool, but then he texted me 8 million times in a row and then I realized he wasn't. Or you know, he did X, Y, Z, because I'm just seeing that constantly. And uh, yeah. 
So what's funny is that I hear the same complaints from women, just so you know. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> yeah, so I have these women who are like in their total anxiety, like desperate, texting the guy to death and smothering the guy until he disappears. So the answer is, I don't think either party likes to feel smothered right. where it's like too much. You, you know what I'm saying? And I do think that a lot of it has to do with maybe their attachment style, like that scarcity mindset that you were right. talking about. Because if you think that there's nothing else out there and you're attaching to the outcome of this particular person, you're like putting too much energy on it. And it, it you know what I think the underlying turnoff is, is that it comes across as not confident, yeah. you know, because you're just, you're, you're trying to get attached to somebody else to give you that confidence because it seems like you're not okay by yourself. I think that's the underlying like subconscious thing that goes on. So it's not that we women like the bad boys who never give us attention, you know, mm -hmm. it's the appropriate amount of attention because we all like to be earned. Right. We all like to be earned, both as men and women. We, you know, and men like to hunt and chase the, the, you know, the art of pursuit is, is good. And I think there was even research on that. A lot of the relationships that lasted over time are the ones where the guys heavily pursued the women. In fact, a lot of times the women didn't even like the guy in the beginning. Right. So yeah, no, there's, so there's something to be said that, but that the, yeah, yeah. And the appropriate amount needs to be there, you know, and, yeah. and it, again, it depends on the chemistry and the makeup of each individual, obviously, but I would say that overall. Right. And you mentioned attachment styles, which is something that I think is really fascinating. And I've noticed just from my own personal experience, kind of going through many different uh, periods where I felt like at one point I was kind of the avoidant attachment style for a bit. Um, and then I was definitely more of the codependent or anxiously attached when I got started in the process. Um, did you ever have an experience where you noticed that in, in either yourself or people you've worked with? Yeah, definitely. I think there was also another study. I just find it fascinating with attachment styles too, is that I think um, they said that online, there tends to be more people who have anxious attachment style, which is interesting, you know, so that if you're encountering that a lot, there's like a lot of dating anxiety out there, you know, and especially nowadays. But um, I think there's, okay, and, and, and this is just me as a therapist, there are true attachment styles that develop early on as a child, they all like start from that. Right. And then it gets, you know, manifested in certain ways as an adult. That is different than circumstantial attachment right. styles, which I think is what you're talking about. Because like, yeah, absolutely. After my divorce, I definitely was a different attachment style than I was like, I, I always considered myself secure attachment up until the divorce happened. And it made me feel like I was crazy and different. And right. then I would get anxious about the whole like dating scene because I just was inexperienced. So yeah. again, it had to do with, you know, a little bit of, of that. So I think we have to be careful of how we label ourselves in that way, but it, what's more important is what's happening with it. You know, right. like if you're finding yourself getting so attached to the outcome and you're a relationship person and you go from one relationship to the next and you've never had that period of time of just like loving dating and being with yourself and understanding like who you are and what you like, then you need to have a period of time in that. Otherwise you keep recreating those like horrible cycles for yourself. Yeah. The, the fascinating thing for me was when I kind of went down the crazy rabbit hole and studied too much sort of pickup stuff, it made me, oh, yeah. it made me more avoidant and it, it was kind of using some of these strategies that are inauthentic, you know, um, tactics to, you know, to attract a certain type of girl. And I would find that I, I got more and more involved in, you know, a bit of the party scene, um, you know, nightclubs and, and that kind of like LA model genre. I was just finding it was fascinating as I started studying this stuff because I was just seeing so many avoidant people, you know, narcissistic people running around and having these horrible dating experiences where like, you know, just some of the stuff that happened to me and some of this, you know, some horrible things I did when I, when I was kind of clueless <laughs> what was going on. Um, 
just like people doing, you know, miserable things to each other from a dating standpoint. Um, at least that was totally interesting to me, especially, you know, in, because LA, as you can imagine, it's a bunch of beautiful people. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Poor LA. We're so like, we're like harping on LA. No, I I, it is a different culture though, for sure. Mm -hmm. And it can cause a lot of like that comparison anxiety that definitely is a different culture for sure. But here's the thing too. And you, you've gone all over the world as well. I think though, this can surface anywhere for sure, yeah. any way, anyhow, it, and it just depends on like your own experiences with it. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm, the, uh, I, I found it the worst at uh, Burning Man. That was a really. Oh, I've never been. Yeah, you I should heard go. that's. It's, um, <laughs> it, I, I mean, heard about it. It attracts, you know, very interesting sort of counterculture people because anyone who's willing yeah. to spend seven days bringing in all their food and water to a desert, you know, they're going to be definitely a, <laughs> a different breed from the the usual. Um, yeah, so that was crazy. So the. The charisma quotient you talked about is, is super cool. Um, I love how you boiled that down into like three simple steps. Um, where can people find out more? How can they go through that process? And are there any like parting thoughts you want to leave the listeners with? Yeah, well, the easiest is to go and listen to Robbie on my podcast at the Charisma Quotient. And that's easy to remember. Um, but yeah, my site is KimmySeltzer.com. And pretty much every social media handle is at Kimmy Seltzer. So you can find me there. And I would say just the parting words of wisdom is, you know, start small, just start small. I think so much of what we're talking about, people get overwhelmed and that's what causes the shutdown. But honestly, the small wins add up to the bigger success. And I love like, like how you do it too. Just, you know, buying a new shirt, getting, you know, more comfortable with eye contact, having really good conversations, doing those exposure type of exercises that you do, Robbie, like all of those things will add up to that bigger win and make you feel more confident in your dating life overall. So, yeah. And I'll, I'll say that if anyone wants to do a virtual makeover, I'm happy to like pass on, um, you know, ways that they can do that. You can find it on my website. And I also have a men's fashion manifesto for men. If, if they yes. would like that, but I know you, you offer that stuff as well. <laughs> no, I think it's so. great to get it from multiple different sources because fashion is such a, you know, th the more I learned about fashion, the more I started to appreciate it. Cause at first I was just one of those guys who was just lazy and I didn't, you know, I yeah. like, oh, <laughs> this, this is convenient, it's comfortable and it gets the job done. But then when I started studying it, I uh, actually enjoy shopping. Now I enjoy putting an outfit together and you know, just having something you wear black t-shirt, black jeans and a dope pair of like crazy shoes. And that can make such a statement. And then the compliments you get on that and so on and so forth. So yeah, guys, check that out. Uh, there'll be links to all that. Kimmy, thanks so much for sharing your wisdom. It's been amazing. Oh my gosh. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad we connected. Thanks for listening. If you want more, go to innerconfidence.com. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast for the latest episodes.